list of 100 things to do before I die, and giving back to my community was one of them. So I'm very humbled to be here today to share with you a discovery that blew my mind. And the experience that ensued in the next couple of months was so intense that it realigned me, it reconnected me with not only my Sikh heritage, but also with my Singapore heritage. In 2011, when the government announced that, that a, uh, the uh, Bukit Brown Chinese Cemetery was to be reclaimed for a highway, I wasn't too concerned because this cemetery, it didn't, it, it didn't really make any sense to me. The, the uh, material culture was foreign and I had no intentions of messing with the supernatural. So I had no business being in this cemetery. For those of you who still don't know what this cemetery is all about, well, it was named after George Henry Brown, who was a British trader. He arrived in Singapore in the 1840s and he built his business here. Estimated to house over 100,000 tombs, this cemetery is the largest cemetery outside of China and the oldest surviving one in Singapore, with some tombs nearly 200 years old. In fact, many Singapore, um, in fact, many famous Singapore pioneers were, were unburied here. You've got uh, Chiu Boon Lay, Chiu Ju Chiet, Gan Eng Seng, and Lim Chong Pang, just to name a few. So coming back to this non-Chinese Singaporean standing in front of you, I didn't care about Bukit Brown until one fine Saturday morning as I was wasting my time over Facebook, these babies showed up on my wall, which looks so much like me, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and the, um, and the um, attention that is being given to the turban and to every curl of the beard, it made me fall in love with the cemetery. And soon, I found myself in this cemetery and, and I was also part of the Save Bukit Brown campaign. This cemetery preserved the identity and this ideal of what it meant to be a Sikh, which made me and my turban feel very at home at the cemetery. Um, here's a picture that I like very much um, in this statue, and it is so amazing how um, lifelike this statue was made to be. You've got the ammunition belt, you've got the dog by its side, you've got the um, pockets with the buttons, and every fold of his shirt is also so realistically captured this statue has a rifle in his hand. It was a standard issue rifle known as the Lee Anfield rifle. In fact, it is still being used by the Singapore Armed Forces Military Police for ceremonial purposes. Here's another picture that I like very much. It's a very small statue and it has a small dagger by its side. This dagger is known as a kirpan, an item that is very symbolic for the Sikhs. So over time, as my curiosity grew, I began studying deeper and deeper into this cemetery. And I did things I never imagined doing. For example, understanding tomb architecture, understanding grave art, and appreciating its symbology. So when I told my mom that I was gonna be spending the next few Sundays at, at this cemetery, she said, you siawa, why you wanna go and learn all these things, <laughs> right? So, so, so your um, sanity does get questioned once in a while. And this is a picture that I like very much as well, and um, this is a schematic of a tomb. It is like a compound that, is, that has a few layers. And so typically, at the front section, you would have the sea god statues, or a Chinese warrior statue, or a similar statue that is placed there to protect the property. This is followed by another pair of statues, known as the Golden Boy and the Jade Maiden statues, who symbolize celestial servants for the afterlife. You've got the Earth Deity, and finally, a pair of lion dog statues to ward off evil spirits. So every element had its place to provide an auspicious aura. Sikhs were not just security guards. Instead, they were elevated to guardians in the afterlife. And I find that truly remarkable as it shows the amount of respect and reverence the Sikhs received. So after this, I decided to have a better understanding of the people who were being guarded by these statues. What was their connection in real life? Take, for instance, Ong Sam Leong, who was a Pranakan Baba, who was, a, who was the coolie labor contractor on Christmas Island. So Christmas Island was known for its phosphate deposits that were mined and consequently exported. And besides being the contractor, he also ran a uh, Kongsi, a society on the island that provided opium and entertainment for the laborers. And he made a lot of money in the process, which is clearly seen by the grandeur of his tomb, which he shares with his wife, and uh, with his family. And his tomb is also elaborately decorated with lions and deities and two life-like sea gods. So where did he get this idea to install a pair of sea gods? 
Well, it was probably due to the sea guards that were posted on Christmas Island. The police force on Christmas Island was feared, well, apart from their features, they were, um, they were stationed to enforce the law to protect British assets and were called in to squash riots by the coolies. So my research took me all the way from, um, from Bukit Brown to Christmas Island, and in this excitement, I asked myself if there were any more forms of Sikh imagery in Singapore. And boy, was I in for a surprise. Uh, this is a picture of a wall plaster that is taken at um, Geelang Road. It is at a shop house, which um, depicts a Sikh god and an Indian god incorporated into a unique Chinese-style backdrop. And here's another one that's taken off a shop house at Balestier Road. It belonged to Madam Sim Cheng Neo, who built this shop house in 1928. Um, Sikh gods were probably used as a stand-in for Chinese warrior gods as door gods to ward off evil spirits. And this, is, and, and this is remarkable evidence of how Singapore's unique ethnic diversity inspired local architecture and culture. In fact, here's another picture that some of you guys might be familiar with if you guys live in the East. Uh, this is a, a much contemporary statue of a sea god. Now, if you think that these statues couldn't get any bigger, well, um, there's uh, this pair that stands guard at this um, old Chinese residence in Singapore. I'm not too sure when this picture was taken. And if you think that only Singapore has a statue, well, there's also one in Penang, Malaysia. Uh, this is a statue that stands guard at the Ku Kong Si uh, Temple. Uh, it stands guard at the um, prayer pavilion. So as all these rediscoveries grew over time, I felt that this information was, was really important, and I had to share this with the Sikhs and with Singaporeans. So I've also spent a lot of time outside of Bukit Brown, where I've been trying to look at other sites of interest, and I've been trying to reframe them from the Sikh perspective. And that was how the Singapore Sikh Heritage Trail was born. In fact, it is still in its conceptualization stage. And if you were to look at this trail, you would notice that there's a cluster of sites at the south of Singapore. And this shouldn't be a surprise because it was our main trading facility. And Sikhs were, of course, part of that fabric where they provided the um, security and the um, police work. So some sites that were, that were really interesting that I came to um, discover was like you've got the uh, Pearls Hill um, Station, you've got the Old Hill Street Police Station, and also the Tanjung Paga Dock Police Station that no longer exists. So it should be pretty evident by now that I grew up with this idea, or in fact, most of us grew up with this idea that Sikhs are a martial race. We are fierce fighters and we're defenders of the community. Most Sikhs come from Punjab, India, and our geographical position has made it very easy for invasion into India, where Central Asian armies would enter from Afghanistan. Sikhism, being a peaceful community that believed in unity and social improvement, found it very hard to live peacefully. And we had to defend our land, and we had to defend our values. In fact, there is a small community within the Sikhs known as the Nihangs, and rightfully, and rightfully so, these are the guardians of the Sikh martial spirit. Heavily armored, this, this group of people still practice the, um, sem the, uh, the uh, traditional styles of the, of the early 17th century Sikh armies. And when finally, when the um, Sikh empire fell to the British, the uh, British decided to harness this uh, martial spirit that the, that the uh, Sikhs had. And Sikhs were therefore deployed as an extension of British dominance over their colonies. According to the British, the Sikhs displayed masculinity, were fairly uncorruptible, and made good policemen. Also, in policing their colonies, the, the uh, British further enforced this Sikh identity through their recruitment policies, where only turban-bearded Sikh men of a, of a certain height, weight, and from a specific clan would make it to the ranks. Therefore, military service became a domain that could produce and police the British vision of a coherent Sikh identity. And this import of this image led to many prominent figures in the Chinese community installing them as sea gods, which I see as a reproduction of that very martiality and masculinity. Therefore, in that space of Bukit Brown, I saw it as an intermingling of histories. It was a moment captured in time. Death is a transition point, not an end state. The living depends on the dead for emotional, social, and economic security. 
and the deceased depends on the dead for food, shelter, and money. There is a mutual dependence. Then it dawned upon me that this wasn't just about my heritage, my people, but rather our heritage. And I asked myself if it was possible to conceive the notion of a shared heritage. And I surprised myself by having discovered a commonality amongst that bewildering array of personal and collective identities. That was how I, re that was how I, re I rediscovered a part of the Singapore story in my Sikh heritage, where Bukit Brown taught me what it is to be a Singaporean, that we are willing to invite and embrace and accept differences, even taking them to our graves. So if a nobody like me has the audacity to go out there to learn about another culture by being in a cemetery, by questioning my own faith, then so can you. Get out, search, and you might just find a crazy, relatable connection that binds us all together. Thank you.